The next that I'm looking at today is Future Neuro, um, SFI Centre for Rare and, and um, Rare and Chronic uh, Brain um, Research and looking at that with David Beatty. Um, so David Beatty is an artist living and working in Dublin. Um, he's currently in Temple Bar Gallery and Studios and has exhibited um, solo exhibitions, but also has been in a number of collective exhibitions, not just in Ireland, but across the world. Um, I've also joined by Christina Reich and Katie Benson from Future Neuro, who are both looking into the areas of epilepsy and rare neurological disorders. Um, so lots of great research in this one. Um, this was an absolutely beautiful collaboration where we had our kind of, I guess, a joint thinking in terms of connectivity and, um, and connectivity in the brain. So looking at that and exploring that just a little bit more. So David, I'm going to come over to you first. We were delighted to see you collaborate with Feature Neuro on this one. Um, we're looking at Shifting Patterns of Light, which is the final name of the piece. And another section called interferometer, which was the one where we looked at the, the trees and the roots, if you remember from the beginning. Um, so just to come into this, um, you looked at neurology, um, you looked at neural connections in particular. So in your own words, can you describe to us what we're seeing um, in, your, in your work, Shifting Patterns of Light? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Marina. Um, yeah, the work, uh, I think from the initial conversations with the research centre, so Susan, Katie and Christina, um, there was just so much to take in, really, and I think that probably applies to all the artists who were involved, but um, it's hard to know where to start, but I was really intrigued by um, the role of electricity in the brain and, and how that is used, really, as a way of processing information and connecting things uh, within the brain. So I focused on that um, as a way of thinking about hyperactivity or hyperconnectivity in the brain. So how um, maybe signals can get sort of confused or sort of mismatched by sort of overstimulation. So uh, I was drawing parallels between um, neural activity and computing. So, and in many ways, there's lots of common language used, uh, such as like in, in the computer world, there's deep neural networks, which is, um, and, and hyperconnectivity is, is also used quite a bit. So I was trying to sort of bring all of those in uh, in a way that could be sort of visually represented, I suppose. Um, and normally my practice is a sculptural practice. So I do use a lot of objects and uh, three dimensional sort of everyday things. Um, so to do that, uh, you can probably see from the images today that um, I use quite a large, TV, so a flat screen TV, so it's a 55 inch TV, just to give you a sense of scale. Um, and it's a broken TV, so I mean, a lot of the conversations, particularly around epilepsy, but just other sort of um, maybe malfunctions or way, sort of disruptions within the brain, uh, I was just trying to maybe think about that as a way of um, like the light and light, the use of light in their research and their in the lab was really prominent. So I was sort of focused on that really. And I suppose with the TV, the process of projecting LEDs and a TV and the disruption in that, the sort of broken screen and how it distorts the image was maybe a starting point for me. Um, so I started with that and then I overlaid that with another video piece or there's another smaller screen um, and that was a way of maybe thinking about this in a virtual exhibition as a way of uh, somebody who has a sculptural practice as a way of thinking about it, how it might be experienced through a screen. So to try and work with both images and sort of distorted images to try and find a solution there. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Millian. Yeah, there is a lot with this piece and there's a lot to take in when you're looking at it as well. We talk about um, neural networks and connectivity and electricity. And I know you also made a link there with bioluminescence. Um, so can you explain that just a small bit more and where you saw that link or how you visualized it? Sure. Um, I think it was some of the earlier conversations, uh, bioluminescence was given as an example of, of how, uh, how it's used in their research um, and imaging of the brain and how uh, it's used to sort of light up. So that the bioluminescence lights up parts of the brains when it's active. Um, and I was really intrigued by the functionality of that, but also just 
the visual of it. So there's some striking images, the research images that I was shown um, of your brains are firing at different points. So it just visually, it reminded me of bioluminescence and marine life. Um, and there's lots of types of marine life that use it. Uh, the sort of anglerfish is sort of one of the more prominent ones, but there's lots of squid and jellyfish that use it as well. So um, within the video, you can probably make out somewhere in the middle is sort of flashing blue lights. And it's a type of squid in Japan that when they're beached, they sort of rub off each other and they, they sort of fire off each other. So there was all these, I find it sort of interesting to think about that in a network sort of way as well, that um, these sort of natural networks within a sort of natural world uh, as, as a way of sort of connecting one thing to another. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, it really came across that those connections actually flowed throughout the artwork. So we might come back to interferometer in a little bit as well. Um, so that's a really nice link in. You're talking about firing and electrical activity. So let's segue off into the brain and the research end of things. So speaking of kind of the visual process, we look at our brain and it's a really complex organ. We actually don't even understand most of what's happening in our brain. So when we look at the patterns that we're talking about with electrical activity, can we look at that from the research side? I might go over to you first there, Christina, because we know that some of your research is actually used in the final artwork. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's it's been such a such a um, a great opportunity to work with with David, and we had such a great brainstorm. So the brain is, uh, I would say, I I, I, I relate it as a very complex and the most complex and fastest computer in the world. So if if we think in in that way, and. Um, so our neurons are firing all the time and that's the, the neurons usually are the stars of the brain and are the, the first things that come up to our mind. But they are firing also like in a, in a physiological way. So all this light uh, is, is, is happening, it's been all the electricity has been creating all the, created all the time in the brain. So much electricity that could light, light up a bulb. And, and this is a, is, a, is a great analogy to, to understand uh, what is actually going on in the brain. So um, uh, that, that would be most of, um, of, 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 of the, the functioning uh, that we have. So of course, we really have a lot to understand about the brain. We, we know a lot, but we still, uh, we still have a long, way, a long way to go. And that's basically what we've been focusing in Future Neuro, to look uh, in, in a different aspect, not only in the normal brain, how it functions, but also what goes different. And uh, I think like David was extremely brilliant uh, representing it in, in his artwork. Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. And I think that collaboration really worked extremely well. So Katie, just to come over to you as well, um, how did you find kind of the, I guess, moving into the world of art using um, your own brain to, to look at how you can display kind of research and how that communication works well. Yeah, I mean, it was a wonderful experience working with David and it was it was really enlightening, I think, for all of us to kind of see our work in a really new way and a different way. Um, I think, you know, as Christina was saying, our, our research in, in the research centre is so wide and varied and it, it was very apt, actually, that the theme of connectivity kind of came up um, because all of our work is connected um, around the, these kind of these neurons and how they send messages around the body. So I, I found it really, actually, it was a really, really fun, fascinating way to kind of see how everything ties together, much like all of the research uh, ties together. It was really, really fascinating. Loved it. Brilliant to hear. Um, so what we might do is I have a, an image over here of um, David's work, which is interferometer. Um, and just to bring you into, I guess, looking at those connections, the neural connections, and then seeing those patterns kind of replicate in nature. I know in my head, I think of mushrooms uh, under, the, under the ground coming up through the forest. Um, but David, I might um, hand this one over to you and just share your image here if you want to show us um, what we should be looking out for in, in the artwork that's in front of us today. Sure. So this is the interferometer piece. Yeah, so I suppose um, as part of the entire project, there's the sculptural element, which is this, the video screen 
or the TV screen with the extra video on top of it. Um, but there, there's also multiple parts. So this is another element, the photographic image, and it's probably about A3 in size, so not that big. But um, And then there was also some activities and sort of engagements with, for primary audience, uh, primary learners. So um, I've, I, as a way of sort of thinking about it as a project, I, I wanted to think about it as a whole, really. And this image was a way of maybe um, sort of thinking about how to represent natural networks. So the root systems of a tree and the branches of a tree became a sort of very obvious way of doing that. But again, in the way that I was trying to think about the broken screen or ways of interrupting um, an image or interrupting the sort of linear sort of process of an image, uh, I used, I took a number of images of one tree. So you can probably tell from this, it's two images that are um, almost stuck together. So um, so one of them is a color image and one was a black and white, but it was taken in the winter. It's a fallen tree that was knocked down in the wind. So it has a combination of roots and branches um, together. So it's sort of hard to figure out what's the roots and what's the branches. And it also has a sort of slight dusting of snow on it. So it's sort of an almost automatically makes it a monochrome sort of image with the, even though one's black and white and one's color. So it has a, a sort of play, visual play on, on the color and a visual play on the composition really. Um, and an interferometer, it's called an interferometer, which um, some of you probably know that, you know, it's, it's a scientific instrument that's used to sort of measure disturbances or waves in sound and light. Um, most recently sort of famously used for uh, detecting dark matter. So this sort of way of dividing the image or dividing light, uh, or, or, or an image as we read it, uh, was a sort of way of sort of thinking about that. Um, so yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, just to draw attention to that piece, I think it's really nice to get the kind of context behind it when you walk into the exhibition space as well. So kind of on a whole, I guess, um, Christina and Katie, you're doing a lot of work into I guess the future of, of where research is going with the brain as well. What can we expect to see in the future of, um, of where we're looking in, in terms of brain research? I'll let you go first, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think like we, we have we have lots of lots to expect. I think like we are we're making a huge progress as I mentioned. We still have lots to discover. We still have lots to understand. Uh, what, another point that I would like to bring from David's work is that usually we focus on neurons and uh, I think he beautifully has shown different uh, processes that are happening in the brain in different lights from different patterns. And uh, there comes other cell types that we are investigating as well and to find the, uh, actual, the, the, their actual role and uh, their, their, their actual function. For instance, in my, research, my own research on epilepsy, so I, I, I really found that extremely interesting. I would say uh, working in therapeutics, uh, I would say we, we are ha having a hard work combining all the areas. And I think this is one of the beauties of, of Future Neuro that we can have the clinical side and scientists working in completely different areas. For instance, like Katie's work is absolutely different from mine and uh, that I work in, in therapeutic side and uh, so uh, it, it's, it's really um, interesting to have all this combination and um, we we'll really hope that we can um, find solutions as regards diagnosis and therapeutics for, for the, brains, uh, the brain diseases. So hopefully we, yeah. we, we get more progress in, in the coming years. That's great to hear. And um, this collaboration has resulted in just a phenomenal amount of work overall. I know we see the artworks on the wall within the exhibition, but not only that, there is a whole host of primary resources. There's a web interface created by David, which is there to explore. And it really opens up this idea of why are we not doing this kind of work already? Why are people not coming together and, and creating these amazing things um, in terms of, terms of that kind of STEAM um, aspect of things? So to come to everyone, is there anything that you think um, in terms of artists and scientists collaborating that can be learned that maybe we're not looking at already? So I might jump to Katie first on that one. Um. I think I think there's real value. I think when when we work as scientists, we we're very specialized in what we do. We look at a very very narrow 
um, view of, of kind of the work that we're focused on. And I think experiences like this help us to, to do what's really important and that's to take a step back and see our work in a, a broader picture. And it helps us not only to understand our own work and put it in the context of what else is going on around, around us, but it helps us to give us ideas of, of new people we can work with and, and new areas that our research can go in. So, I mean, it goes beyond just, you know, the, the, these fabulous resources and it, it, it's really valuable, I think, for the research itself as well. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thanks, Katie. I might jump over to you then, David. Um, yeah, well, I think in simplistic terms, like often scientists are looking for answers and maybe artists are maybe asking questions. And I think the process of working together actually reveals a lot of commonality and sort of methodologies of like how we work. It's like the lab is often quite like a studio. So, you know, it's there's a lot of common sort of practices there. And I think the more you work with each other, uh, it sort of reveals that there are lots of sort of interesting ways of working together and lots that can be produced and come out of it for uh, or benefit both parties. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, yeah, long may continue. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is the start of some great things and I, I can't wait to see the responses of students to the resources that you've managed to create together because there is such a wealth of information in there. So just to um, introduce Kira as well. So Kira is also on your team in Future Neuro um, working in the public engagement side of things. Um, and Kira was also involved in this collaboration. And again, we'll be looking at kind of the future of this where it can go with resources and stuff, but also with the exhibition itself being open for three months. There's loads to play with there and what you can do with that. So Kira, to come over to you on the public engagement side of things, where do you think projects like this can lead us? Hello everyone, thanks Marina. Um, I just had to jump in purely on from the perspective of that the collaboration between art and science. Um, one thing I will say is it takes the, the fear away. I think people are quite scared of science ever so slightly, um, whether it be from an experience we've had at school or whether it be, you know, memory or whatever the case may be. And just from a personal point of view, which I know that we said many times in our brainstorming experiences, it's so lovely to see uh, bright ideas, the engagement from the public when it comes to ourselves, maybe thinking about David's wonderful work and the engagement and the, the appetite is there. And I think that's what's really important not to forget that, you know, we all do our individual roles and think that, you know, I'm doing my job and that's enough, but actually the appetite for the combination is there. And I think and hope that this is just the beginning of a wonderful collaboration and to continue it and continue that road of creativity as well. Oh, I just love your energy, Kira. I can feel it coming through the screen. That's fantastic. I think there's no better note or nothing more that I could say that can recap that so beautifully. So on that, thanks a million to David Beauty. Thanks a million to the Future Neuro team. You have been fantastic. And I can only imagine that there's more to come following this, judging by your words, Kira. So we really look forward to that. Um, and again, check out David's work and the resources if you're in, in the teaching side of things as well. So on that, um, we're going to say goodbye from this panel. Um, so it was great to have you and thank you for participating in the project.